Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is the biological evolutionary impulse. My guest is Jude Curavan, who is both a physicist and an archaeologist. She is the author of many books, including The Wave, A Life-Changing Journey into the Heart and Mind of the Cosmos, The Eighth Chakra, The Thirteenth Step, A Global Journey in Search of Our Cosmic Destiny, written with Irvin Laszlo Cosmos a co-creator's guide to the whole world, the cosmic hologram, information at the center of creation, and most recently, the story of Gaia, the big breath, and the evolutionary journey of our conscious planet. Jude lives in the United Kingdom, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Jude. It's a real pleasure once again to be with you. I, absolutely, Jeff. This is such a joy for me as well. In our previous interview, we talked mostly about the evolution of the cosmos going back 13.8 billion years, and only maybe a third of that time involved biological evolution, and we went over it very briefly. Uh, today, I want to focus primarily on the last roughly four billion years of, of biological evolution, but I think it's important to begin by stressing that the uh, cosmological conditions had to be just right before it would have been possible for e even the most basic biological molecules to exist. Absolutely. But I think we, we also touched, didn't we, last time on the way that, you know, we often think that biological organisms are, are children of our planetary home, Gaia, and indeed they are. But the precursors of those biological organisms, the prebiotic molecules, the complex carbon-based molecules, together with, with water ice, um, were already present in interstellar dust clouds. And, and basically, those interstellar dust clouds, which we've got some wonderful photos of from Hubble and now the James Webb Telescope, are, are planetary, are birthing places for planetary systems and crucially for that, that possibility of ongoing evolutionary complexity that would become when our planetary home was formed, the beginnings of biological life here. But they began, we began in that sense in interstellar dust clouds, millions, perhaps even hundreds of millions of years before our planetary home and our planetary system was even formed. It's fascinating to look at some of these astronomical photos of these huge clouds, many light years across, that exist within our own galaxy and seem to be the birthing place of stars. But they are of stars, and they are also of planets that accompany stars, because there's so much material there. You know, stars tend to form primarily from hydrogen and then go on to, 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 you know, um, synthesize, uh, more complex elements. But these clouds are full of dust from earlier stars and all that abundance, those nutrient abundances and much vast amounts of, of water ice. So there's all of the sort of the, 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 um, the ingredients, <laughs> the ingredients to then go on and continue to evolve once planets, uh, are formed, such as rocky planets, such as Gaia. Well, I gather that one of the greatest mysteries in all of biology is how the very first Living organisms were were created, and and to my understanding, the the main thing that's necessary for any kind of an organism is a membrane. 
Yes, because a membrane differentiates an organism from its its surroundings, and and that's what essentially makes it an organism. But what we're finding in those interstellar dust clouds is essentially all the prebiotic ingredients. So we a biology a biological organism needs a membrane, yes, and that's usually sort of made up of of particular molecules called lipids. But it also needs an ability to grow and to replicate. So there, we also need what's called amino acids that can then come together to, to make proteins and make bodily structures. We also need in biological organisms sugars and carbohydrates, which are essentially the fuel to metabolize and allow uh, an, an organism to, to breathe, to exist. And crucially, we need DNA and RNA, which is the genetic code of a biological organism that really tells that organism or supports that organism's um, bodily structure and template. All of those building blocks we have now found in interstellar dust clouds ready when a planetary home can nurture them to then come together and begin to assemble into the very simplest of, of cellular biological life. I'm under the impression that how life may have begun is a, a question of little ponds of, of water that are full of these chemicals, and then and then they dry out, and then it uh, they become perhaps through rain or uh, some other process they get wet, so dry and wet and dry and wet and dry and wet, and eventually some sort of filmy substance is created, which is the beginning of uh, uh, the membranes. Indeed, and that's one possibility. I mean, there's a number of possibilities that are still under active investigation, but that's certainly one. But that would require land. And there's still a debate to what degree Gaia was a water planet from the very beginning. We know, we know our planet is now a beautiful blue-green water planet with about 71% surface, her surface covered with water. But it may have been even more than that and possibly even a planetary ocean in those very early epochs. And we're now realizing that, you know, the old paradigm of perhaps the beginning of Gaia being quite a hellish, incredibly hot place might have been actually far more gentle, <laughs> relatively so, <laughs> in terms of this very early beginnings of life. I think, though, we need to take a step back even more and, and back to what we were discussing uh, last time which is that our universe is innately intelligent. It's a living universe. It manifests as meaningful, meaningfully informed and, and uh, purposefully evolved. So it, it's stuff, it's basic stuff of our universe is more fundamental than energy and matter and space-time. It's that information, that meaningful information that literally informs all we call our universe as reality. So in that sense, we have to appreciate that our universe embodies an, an impulse, an inherent impulse to evolve from simplicity to complexity. So it's not just as though, you know, these, these, these nurturing environments or the possibilities, because we could also talk about hydrothermal, thermal hot vents uh, under the ocean as also potential birthing places for biology. It's that our universe was almost actively looking for places <laughs> to make sure that that evolutionary impulse could continue. And the informational guidance and processes and innate intelligence really was opportunistic in terms of, of bringing together any possibility for that ongoing emergence of biological life to, 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 you know, to, take, to take hold and begin its long journey to us. Well, you're addressing what I think is the deepest issue in biology today, the biggest controversy. And I know conventional scientists, biologists, ever since T.H. Huxley over 100 years ago, argued that it's all accidental, that their purpose, the very idea of intention or teleology is outlawed from science completely. I, I, I think you're giving um, Mr. Huxley a bad rap here. Oh. 
<laughs> okay. okay. Um, and, and funnily enough, for the UK launch of the story of Gaia, we held it in the, the museum in Oxford, where he, Huxley, on behalf of Charles Darwin, had debated this new theory of evolution um, with many um, theologians. And he was known as, as Darwin's bulldog because he was so adamant of what's happening. I can't find anything in writing that Huxley and Darwin himself sort of saw evolution in, in terms of randomness and accidentalness because they didn't know. And both of them were good scientists. And Darwin only reported what he could observe, which that there was an evolutionary process, an adaptation process, variability, he called it, and then adaption where that variability through um, through through sort of a lineage became better adapted to a particular environment. It was only later, I think, when other folks took the whole ideas further and were very much in a materialist, separatist paradigm that this idea of randomness came on board. We can talk about this because we now know that biological evolution is not driven, categorically not driven by random occurrences. I do know that the co-author of the theory of natural selection with Darwin, Alfred Russell Wallace, was a spiritualist and very much inclined to think about purpose as innate in in the cosmos, uh, and even related to such questions as survival of consciousness after death. But uh, he and Darwin split over this issue. They did, but also Darwin, before he actually was invited as a gentleman naturalist on the Voyage of the Beagle, had for some time studied uh, theology at university. So it wasn't so much that they, you know, the, the idea of the, the continuation of consciousness, I think, was a, a, a disparity. But he was a deeply spiritual man. And yet what he wanted to do was almost show the, the, the sort of the guidance of a deeper perspective through these processes of biological evolution. Um, and he himself only spoke to what he could observe. And he was an extraordinary observant uh, an authentic scientist in, in what he did. As I understand it, then, you see yourself very much in the same tradition as Darwin. I hope he'd have approved, and I hope he would be jumping up and down with joy at this sort of the latest science and what it's showing, because, again, I'm hoping that I'm bringing all the evidence together and following the evidence, and this is what he did. He followed the evidence where it led, without expectation, without sort of jumping ahead. We are in an incredibly fortunate position now of, of with our technologies, being able to see deeper, further than, than obviously he could 160 years ago. And yet what we're seeing now, I think, would have underpinned and framed his worldview, um, you know, of, of an intelligent and an intelligence that flows through reality. Well, I suppose the the contrary argument would be that we live in a very special planet, maybe one out of, who knows, billions, where life as we know it is possible, and the other planets just weren't so lucky. Well, certainly when we look at our planetary system, which I'll come to in a second, that possibly is the case, but we look out to these interstellar dust clouds that are pervasive through our entire galaxy. Yeah. So to just think that their ongoing emergence would just land on one particular planetary home out of all of those. We also now know that there are probably more planets than stars in our entire galaxy. There are up to about 400 billion stars, so more than 400 billion planets. We also now know, and, and just with our current knowledge, and we're finding more each day, that there are about 11 million Earth-sized planets existing as ours does in what's called a habitable zone, circling their stars. So to, to so pull all of that down to a single planet, we also know, of course, that um, in the early years of, of our solar system, Mars and likely Venus, as well as Gaia, were water planets. 
we also have some really good evidence that suggests that some of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn have under ice liquid water oceans. So given all of the vast panoply of prebiotic you know, building blocks for biological life, um, you know, it's very, it's very likely that we will find that life, biological life did begin as well on Mars before it came to a halt, possibly on Venus and possibly still exists in those subsurface oceans of, of, uh, of some of the moons of, uh, of Jupiter and Saturn, as well as many, many other solar systems. Yeah, I would imagine that there there could be thermal vents that you've talked about earlier on some of those moons. So they have a heat source as well. They do, and we've actually seen jets coming out of of one moon that yeah. that you know we can analyze spectroscopically. So you know we're finding more and more each time, and hopefully we'll be able to send some probes to do flybys initially in maybe the next decade or so. So this is an incredibly exciting time after so long where most scientists have actually argued that we're the only forms of biological life in the universe for that again, potentially to be completely turned upside down. Getting back to our planet, one of the interesting statistics that I found in, in your book, and correct me if I'm not saying it exactly right, but I believe I read that there are more viruses or simple organisms on this planet than there are stars in the entire universe. Pretty much. I mean, viruses are some of the oldest and the simplest of Gaia's biological children. And again, for many years, and indeed still, some biologists would say that viruses aren't biological life forms because they require a host to activate. But viruses, despite their apparent simplicity, in communities actually communicate with each other. We found out now that viruses have dialects. They have their own languages within their own communities. And they're the only ones, organic children of Gaia, that can actually retro-engineer their host's genetic code. So however simple they appear, first of all, they're the only one of Gaia's organic children that's managed to, to, to stop us in our tracks for over two years. And, you know, they're, they are incredible beings. Um, and also they are and have been throughout Gaia's story, change agents, evolutionary change agents. And in, in fact, I believe they mutate much faster than uh, bacteria and, and other single-celled organisms. Yes, because they're simpler and they're promiscuous. <laughs> so they'll, they'll, have, they'll connect with anybody, basically, <laughs> <laughs> and do so. So they can mutate very quickly and they mutate to their benefit, of course. But that benefit can either be to kill a host or it can be to enter into a symbiotic relationship with a host, in which case they essentially become co-evolutionary partners with their host organisms. We did briefly touch on this last time, the idea of horizontal gene transfer, a, a form of I, I guess you could call it reproduction, but completely unlike the uh, sexual reproduction that uh, large animals such as ourselves experience. It is. It, it's really more about the difference between what's known as vertical gene transfer, which is a lineage, which is parent to child to child to child, and then this horizontal, where there are different types of how that horizontal gene transfer can happen, um, but it creates hybridization. It can tr transcribe the genetic code of organisms, and it seems to be especially important. It's, it happens all the time. But we touched on last time, and I suspect we'll go deeper today, in the way that Gaia's whole story has really pulsed in, in, in sort of whole waves of simplicity to complexity and then often catastrophic breakdowns and then 
When that happens, horizontal gene transfer really comes into its own across the whole of Gaia's biosphere. Because at that point, when the old order of, of the, the biological organisms, you know, comes to an end of an epoch, horizontal gene transfer is absolutely vital in, in fundamentally changing the whole architecture of the biosphere to then go forward to its next level of simplicity and even greater levels of complexity. And one example of horizontal gene transfer, I gather, would be symbiosis. It can be. I mean, symbiosis is a relationship and it takes different forms. Um, so you don't have to have horizontal gene transfer to get enter into a symbiotic relationship. So, for example, you can have fungi and plants have, have age-old, half a billion year old uh, symbiotic relationships. We can have as, as, as cells have moved into becoming from single celled and previously without a nucleus to having a nucleus, having little um, organ organelles within them that are the sort of the fuel, the engines of the cell. All of those are examples of symbiosis and cooperation. Horizontal gene transfer can form part of those relationships, but it also enters into the whole of the evolutionary journey in, in many other in many other ways. For example, well, hybridization, where you get two different types of plants coming together and, and actually having um, a sort of a horizontal gene transfer to create to create a hybrid plant, for example. That also occurs with animals, I believe. It does. There is there's an interesting point, though, that as we go through this whole journey from simplicity to complexity, as biological organisms become more complex, they become less flexible. So at that point, uh, the more complex a, a, an organism is, such as an animal, such as ourselves, it's less easy for our bodily forms to change. So now we are at a point where instead of horizontal gene transfer, our opportunity and our potential may be to consciously evolve through transformation of our worldview, our perception of who we are. And I describe that sometimes as being horizontal meme transfer <laughs> because it, it's, it's communicating instead of through genes and genetics, although we do that as well through something called epigenetics yeah. with lifestyles and all of that. But our memes, the stories we tell about ourselves, that could be how we consciously evolve when we begin to tell different stories. And of course, what we're sharing today is a different story, is a, is a new and unitive narrative mm -hmm. compared to the story we've been telling each other for some time now. I had never really considered that I'm engaging in horizontal meme transfer. You do it all the time. <laughs> That's what you do so brilliantly. Now, but going back to biological evolution on, on the planet, it starts some four billion years ago. And I recall on our last interview, I didn't really grasp that fully. But for most of that time, the organisms that existed were, I, I think you used the term prokaryote, meaning they didn't have a nucleus. They, they, they were single-celled organisms. They had obviously no nervous system. They, they, they weren't particularly differentiated, and yet they managed to form colonies and, and, and to find uh, adaptive survival mechanisms. Absolutely. And many of them still exist. And, you know, obviously not having a nucleus is simpler than having a nucleus. So the earliest cells were indeed prokaryotes without a nucleus. And they, and they breathed methane. They didn't breathe oxygen. In that early epoch of Gaia's story, we could not have survived because the atmosphere would have been incredibly toxic for us. It was described as being anaerobic. In other words, there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. So those very earliest cells breathed methane. And a time came, though, where they weren't able, because actually breathing methane doesn't offer a lot of energy. 
So breathing methane and, 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 and the evolution from simplicity to complexity needs more and more energy. So a time came where those early anaerobic, um, single-celled um, prokaryotes that we know as archaea and some bacteria as well um, made, a, made a choice in a sense, and they learned to begin to breathe in a different way. And very slowly, as they learn to breathe in oxygen, which is quite a toxic element, it, it, you know, we call antioxidants because left to, from, uh, to roam free through our bodies, oxygen is damaging. But at a very early stage, one of those little beings learned to breathe oxygen. And what they did was very, very clever. First of all, they breathed oxygen. So they were providing you know, fuel, energy for themselves. But then a larger, a larger prokaryote at that time ingested these little ones. And when they were ingested, that larger bacteria, that larger archaea, was also able to begin to breathe oxygen and therefore have more energy to grow and become more complex. But of course, within the cell, before that, the genetic code had been throughout the cell. But if that was continue, that oxygen going into the cell, if it started to seep out of those little engines, it would destroy the genetic code. So the cell learned how to wrap all its DNA code into a nucleus. So two evolutionary leaps, one, to be able to breathe oxygen, two, to create a nucleus, that then kick-started that next advance, that next incredible evolutionary leap. Now, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand that the, these early organisms that began breathing oxygen and getting absorbed into larger prokaryotes, today almost all animals have them, and we know them as mitochondria, little aspects of every single cell in every animal that were once independent organisms. Absolutely. And the lovely thing is, the mitochondria brought their own genetic code with them, and that genetic code stays with them. So when we talk about our, our DNA lineage, we can, we can trace that lineage through our X and Y chromosomes, but it's only through the X chromosomes, the mitochondria, that we trace our matri matri matrilineal line. So that goes back billions of years to that first ingestion and the first eukaryotes, the first nucleated cells, and ever since. And, and so you refer to, uh, it was a very interesting term. I know it had four letters. Uh, the, really, the first cell that would be the ancestor of all animals on, on the earth today. It's Luca. Yeah. <laughs> Luca. And we, I mean, one of the wonderful things about the, the science we, we now have and the technologies we have, we can trace these lineages back. And what's happened as a result, is we found a very different story than the, 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 the old paradigm of a sort of the tree of life with, you know, us as the, 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 the sort of the apex, you know, we're sort of off to one side, really. <laughs> we may be the most complex, but the largest stream, streams are the bacterial streams, the archaea streams. And, and so the animal stream, yes, indeed, is complex. For a long time, um, there was a debate where, where Fungi, animals, or, or plants, but they're a, they're their own. They're their own type of being, and they are actually closer to being animals than plants. And yet, they've had this incredible symbiotic relationship with plants ever since. Together, they inhabited the land of Gaia about five hundred million years ago. So, Gaia's whole story is one of collaboration, and and as the move from simplicity to complexity, it's cooperation. Now, Luca, going back to Luca, the, I think it's the last... Universal uh, common ancestor. The last uni 
universal common ancestor. So this is very important because we we share an ancestry with all other uh, animals. I'm not sure about plants or or fungi, but uh, with with this Luca. And I don't recall exactly, but I think you wrote that it goes back maybe 500 million years, which is relatively recent in, in the large scale picture. It does. But when we go back and back and back and back, all of Gaia's biological children emanate from those first single celled, non-nucleator cells, methane breathing mm. beings. And, and what is also wonderful um, is that the DNA, the genetic code of DNA and RNA was there from the very beginning. It was right first time. So we all share the same DNA, the genetic, you know, the, 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 the genome, you know, the number of, 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 of genes differ very, very much, but not in the way that most people would expect. But we all of us, whether animal, plant, um, archaea, bacteria, viruses, we all share the same DNA, RNA genetic code. And another interesting factoid I got from your book is that the human uh, genetic code, the gene sequence in human beings is much smaller than the genetic code for something like a, a grain of rice. Absolutely. We have about 22,000 genes in our, in our genetic code. Um, I think the, the largest one in comparison is an onion, which has 12 times that amount. <laughs> so cress, rice, onions all have more genes than we do. But that was such a shock when the original, well, you know, the work was done to actually find, to discover that. But of course, the other thing that has come forward, is that genes and the genetic code, the genome can express itself in different ways as different pro uh, proteins. So a single gene can express itself in up to, I think, 10 different proteins. So the, you know, the, 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 ge the genetic code is not the master of the cell or the organism. It is a template. It is a library. It is a servant of how that organism intelligently communicates within itself as a coherent whole and within its surround and with its surroundings so dependent on what those circumstances are the genetic code will be expressed as different proteins at different times in different ways it's extraordinarily amazing when you think that we and all other animals are are so differentiated. We have muscles and bones and nerve cells and blood cells and uh, all of these different organs. And, and somehow uh, all of that differentiation is programmed to some extent, not entirely, by uh, these genes. I think you use the term of Hox gene for the particular gene that expresses that differentiation. Yes, there are a group of genes called Hox genes, and they come into play um, within a fetus because they actually are the guidelines for that bodily structuring of a fetus from the original source stem cells um, you know, when the sperm meets the egg and, and, the, and the, the stem cells form, all the way through as that fetus develops. But it's, it's even more than that. What we have are coherent, our bodies are coherent informational systems that are in continuous communication at every level of every cell with every organ and, and, and holarchic, you know, in the sense that we are a coherent community, each of us, of 37 trillion cells, of which many are non-human. They are fungal. They are, they are, um, bacterial. They are viral. And in fact, a whole raft of, of human endogenous retroviruses called herbs also play critical roles in, in developing and maintaining that coherence. 
So it's a very, very complex system and every piece of it has to work together. Uh, you made a point of saying, uh, for example, that none of this life would have been possible if there hadn't been an ozone layer around the planet shielding uh, the, uh, all of biology from uh, ultraviolet rays and, and other rays coming from the cosmos. Absolutely. And, and you know, an ozone level was only there once the, the atmosphere was oxygenated. And the oxygenated atmosphere and the ability of organisms to breathe oxygen meant that there was the ability to evolve greater complexity and move from the oceans where, you know, life primarily, and, and to be honest, almost certainly um, formed the earlier life around 500 million years ago when the first plants and fungi um, began to move onto the land and then followed by very earliest animals. Without an ozone layer, which is very high in the atmosphere and incredibly thin, without that, the UV light, as you say, would have been toxic. It would have been destructive to any ability for Gaia's um, biological organisms to, to, um, to, to move onto the land. Now, I recall when I lived in Nevada, I would go hiking in the desert there and you would find seashells and in the middle of the Nevada desert. And I learned from the geologists around that these organisms were about 500 million years old. And I learned from your book and elsewhere that that was a period known as the Cambrian Explosion, a, a huge, I would call it a fermentation or some kind of a fluorescence of, of a, a huge variety of life forms at, at that time. And it's really interesting because those, the, the before the Cambrian, I don't like to call it an explosion. I love what you said, you know, the emergence, the effulgence. It was incredible. Before that, um, and still living in, in the waters of, of Gaia was an epoch called the Ediacaran. And the Ediacaran epoch, or epoch was when the first tiny animals, multi-celled animals, true animals began to, to, to emerge. And they were quite simple and some of them look more like plants than animals. But in that era, um, it's often called the Garden of Ediacara because there was no uh, prey and predator relationships. You know, the various animals and plants had their niches and they got along together, but they weren't really evolving beyond that very much because sometimes it does need that tension and that conflictual, you know, push and pull to, to move things along. And so the end of the Adikaran, the, the environment changed. And this is a, this is a characteristic of Gaia's story that, you know, different levels of carbon dioxide and, and oxygen ebb and flow. And with that and with other sort of geological events and volcanism, they tended to drive evolution. But the Cambrian, was this incredible opening up at the end of the Adekara note where there is a catastrophic loss of that previous epoch. But what happened is that by then, the Adekarans had started to develop ways of using minerals uh, in their bodily structures. So you get in the Cambrian, suddenly you get shells and you get skeletons and you get teeth and you get claws, and you get this sort of evolutionary race to complexity and between food chains of predator and prey, which drove complexity. And it's the most incredible moment in Gaia's story where you never get back to the sort of the Garden of Eden or Ediacara per se, but you do actually continue this amazing ongoing evolutionary impulse. In one of the creatures that I think emerged at this time that you write about, probably the most amazing creature uh, of all in uh, on this planet, I think it's called the tardigrade or the water bear. The tardigrade is incredible. And, you know, I, I sort of, when I was writing about this tiny little being, you know, millimeters, and they, they live a, a, across most of the, of the environmental niches on Gaia. But some of them are what's known as extremophiles. Um, and there are other types of extremophiles, including bacteria and archaea. 
but a tardigrade is incredibly resilient. And if if um, it's living in an environment that's so conducive, it will go about its business and all's good. But if that environment becomes much more difficult, it enters what's called a TUN state, T-U-N state, which is a state of dormancy. But when the environment then sort of e- eases up, it sort of awakens from this, this dormancy and carries on. But this dormancy in these environments, you know, experiments show it can live at the bottom of the deepest ocean and still essentially resurrect itself. It can go into outer space and then uh, not just have the cold and the vacuum of outer space, but all that UV light that isn't held back by the ozone layer. It's flown, tardigrades have been flown in space and come back to Earth and resurrected, rehydrated, (laughs) and gone on to breed. I mean, this is the most incredible species. And one of the things that occurs to me, I'd love your sense of this, is it's almost that with archaea and bacteria that are still very much prevalent on Gaia, they're almost Gaia's insurance in case circumstances mean that more advanced, well, not advanced, but more complex biological organisms, for whatever reason, don't survive. You know, even, God forbid, but even if Gaia herself potentially perished, there's an argument that tardigrads could go through space and land somewhere else. I mean, they're so amazing. It's really something to contemplate, I have to say. The tiniest uh, little little creatures like that. It, it makes you really wonder uh, how it is we evolved to such complexity. They apparently never needed to evolve any further because they were already well adapted to every extreme. Exactly, exactly. And yet, you know, as we were saying, there's these pulses of simplicity to complexity. And, and you know, and if you if you don't sort of, if you're not open to this possibility of our universe being a living, sentient entity that embodies an evolutionary impulse, why? Why keep going? Why just not stop where the tardigrades are and say, okay, that's good enough? And that's not what's happened through Gaia's story, through the entire universe's story. And it seems to me that, as we, we're seeing, we're finding, we're rediscovering that our universe exists and evolves as a unified entity, that its unity can be more expressed in individuated self-awareness. And I think my sense is that's why the universe's evolutionary impulse keeps going, to know itself at these levels of self-awareness and in an ongoing way that we can even have such a conversation as we are. Well, of course, I'm very interested in consciousness. And typically, neuroscientists, of course, think that you need a nervous system in order to have consciousness. But we see in these single-celled organisms, they don't have a nervous system, and yet they behave in ways that suggest uh, that some sort of intelligence is operating. What I'm putting forward with the cosmic hologram and the story of Gaia is our universe is innately conscious, is innately sentient. So that sentience is exhibited throughout the entirety of existence. But I, I wonder whether you're you're referring to a slime mold. <laughs> slime molds are some of my favorite beings. A slime mold indeed is a single celled Uh, organism without a central nervous system. And they're one of um, science's great um, experimental favorites. Because when, when a a slime mold is, 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 is centered, for example, on a tray on a two dimensional surface in a laboratory, there have been experiments to see what level of sort of sentience, what sensing, what movement could a slime mold make without any of that nervous system infrastructure? And so it appears that in a laboratory, the favorite food of slime molds is oat flakes. So over a number of years, um, scientists have um, actually uh, positioned oat flakes. And then in the middle of a field of oat flakes positioned, 
they placed a slime mold and then see what happens. And there's a wonderful uh, and fairly early experiment where the slime molds find the, the, the oat flakes, which they love, and they do so in the most efficient way without a nervous system. They reach out, they find their ways to the, to the oat flakes, however they're positioned. But one experiment positioned oat flakes in a very special way. And that was to actually replicate the map of the metro system of the greater Tokyo uh, transport hub. So all of these oat flakes were stationed, uh, were acting as stations in the Tokyo metro hub. Slime mold put in the middle and then saw how the slime mold reached out to each of those oat flakes. And what it did was it actually replicated the supercomputer derived metro system of Tokyo, which had taken a long time, a long time to develop. They could have asked a slime mold. And in fact, since then, other systems, other transport systems have used that non-nervous system sentience, that distributed intelligence of a slime mold rather than very expensive supercomputers to help to design and develop transport networks. My goodness, I, I, I didn't realize it had gone that far that, that the slime, slime mold is competing with a supercomputer. No, it's winning. <laughs> well, you write about a fascinating meditation of your own with, as I recall, the dog vomit slime mold. The dog vomit slime mold. I just, yes. I mean, at the beginning of each chapter of the story of Gara, I do write a, a, about attunement. Or, and I just wanted to sort of sense into these very, very different type of sentience. And of course, slime molds, as, as, as many biological organisms are, you know, some are a community that itself is, is distributed intelligence, um, with no central nervous system and yet still communicates. You know, there, there are, there are wonderful examples that I give in the book where, um, amoeba and, and various sort of, um, organisms, when the environment is, is, has a lot of abundance in it, they split up. They literally become individuated organisms. But when times are tough, they come together and they look out for each other. And together they are stronger than the sum of their parts. And sometimes that means they together become dormant until things are easier. Sometimes they, they create spores so they can, as a community, uh, set, you know, uh, spread their, their, um, their intelligence to offer themselves a continuation that they may not be able to have in their current situation. So there are incredible ways and numerous ways in which guys, biological children have ingeniously, because of that innate intelligence, found ways forward to survive and thrive and evolve. Slime molds, if, if I understand correctly, are colonies of single-celled organisms. They don't really have any individuated organs of their own. Well, a slime mold itself is, is a single cell, but others are multi-celled and, and communities, as you say. It varies. And of course, we see that as also at perhaps more complex um, organisms such as insects, you know, uh, termites, ants, wasps, bees are all what's called eusocial organisms in the sense that they, they embody a sort of a communal hive mentality. So you mean a slime mold, which could be as, as large as the palm of my hand or bigger, is a single cell? Can be, yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize Many others are microbial mats where they are a colony, as you say, a colony of, of single celled and coming together and then coming away and coming together again, depending on the circumstances. You've raised a, a number of fascinating questions. We're talking about an innate intelligence, even in a, a single celled creature without a nervous system. And, and sentience is another term you've used. We've also talked about self awareness and of the human. And as I'm under the impression that there are forms of consciousness on Gaia in, in the biosphere 
let's say, beehives or ant colonies or termite colonies or colonies of single-celled organisms, we have no idea how, how they operate. I mean, we may understand the, the, how they process information, but nothing about their consciousness. I mean, there was a time when biologists really considered that the only biological organism um, on, on Gaia that had consciousness was, was us. And now that, that's been completely sort of, you know, taken out as any sort of concern. I think that it's a work in progress because more and more biologists are realizing that the further down we go, the further back we go, the further wider we go, the consciousness is, is, is pervasive. From my perspective, from a cosmological point of view, way beyond biology, we have the evidence our entire universe is conscious, that mind and consciousness aren't something we have. They're literally what we in the whole world are. And our universe from that very get-go of 13.8 billion years, of the first moment of the big breath, embodies that sentience, that consciousness, that on that great evolutionary arc is individuated progressively in self-aware beings, whether they're eusocial, whether they're slime molds, whether they're, but the whole Gaia sphere is sentient. The whole of our planetary home is sentient in that sense. Do you distinguish at all between sentient and conscious? I don't really, um, and I would tend to generally use the word consciousness, but when I'm talking about a biosphere, sometimes I'll use that word sentience, um, you know, because it's also through our senses, but it's not just through our senses, of course. But it, I, that for me, and also living is, is the entirety of our universe. So again, extending this perception of what's living to the entire universe. So I, 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 my senses were in a wonderfully exploratory and hopefully expansive remembering of, of this perception. Um, and, and, and of this perception that mind and consciousness of self-aware mind or sentient mind, as it were, is, is who we are, is what the whole world is. It's tricky to me to consider trying to look outside the human world and, and pr to project onto it our own sense of self-awareness. I, I do have a sense that there's a purpose to the universe and, and that we are an expression of that purpose. Yes, absolutely. And I think it's really important that we try not to impose our sort of anthropic worldview outwards. But I think the great things about the technology we do have is that we can look out into the universe, we can look far back, we can see things. And yes, we interpret them. But when we dig deeper, the underlying signatures, the mathematical signatures, the intelligence of the signatures, the you know, the the, the non-random patterning, the relational aspects of it, are there whether we're here or not. We're here and, and joyously so to, you know, to, to experience and perceive. But, you know, if it was another self-aware species on another planet, and we talked about this earlier, you know, the, the same physics is universal. The same mathematics that underpin the physics is universal. The same relational, you know, deep geometric relational, harmonic re resonant relationships are universal whether we're here or not. And you've also suggested, I think, that the, the whole universe of DNA and RNA is uh, universal. If we find life on other planets, it's very likely going to be based on DNA. It seems to be the case because an analysis that I, I talk about in, in the story of Gaia is there's been a mathematical analysis of the efficiency of DNA. And when we look at thousands of other possible um, sort of assemblages, DNA as it is for all the biological children of Gaia and was from the very beginning is the most efficient. It's a it's 100,000 times more efficient than pretty much any other assemblage 
would be able to be. And knowing that, you know, in the interstellar dust clouds, we have all of these prebiotic harbingers, including for, for, for DNA, RNA, and, and including for lipids and sugars and proteins, which interrelate with RNA and DNA. It suggests that this is universally the most efficient way of a universe's evolutionary impulse to embody its further emergence into biological organisms. Well, let me jump way ahead for a moment, Jude, because I, I know in, in your book, The Cosmic Hologram, you uh, write a lot about information. And uh, there's a sense in which I think you kind of equate information with consciousness. At, at the same time, we humans are creating a, a whole world around us, an electronic world, a, a digital world, a world based on silicon that is very capable of processing information. And yet, I, I don't think it would be correct to say that the, the silicon universe is in any way conscious the way we are. It's a very interesting conversation about that, because if our universe is innately conscious, is innately informational, with that hyphen between in and formational being meaningful information, then our technologies are part of that evolutionary impulse. The difference between carbon-based, as it were, embodiment of consciousness, and silicon-based embodiment, potentially, potentially, of awareness and even self-awareness, is that carbon is more effective in making bonds that allow more abundance and flexibility. It's just, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the best element it, which is why when all the biology, all biological organisms are overwhelmingly made up of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, because those, those elements have the most abilities to bond in various ways, to have strong and weak bonds that are flexible, all the amazing ways that those chemical elements can relate are perfect, are just incredible for biological life, where silicon isn't able to do that same connectivity job as carbon is. You use the phrase meaningful information. Maybe I'm getting a little philosophical with you, but I, I kind of tend to distinguish between mind and consciousness. I think a, a computer has a mind. It can calculate. It can do mathematics, for, for example. Uh, in, in fact, they're superior, for the most part, to humans in, in doing calculations. So, I think of that as mind, but consciousness is... Uh, well, I, I like Thomas Nagel's definition, uh, which he says, to be conscious means that it, it's like something to be you. I agree. I agree. Mm -hmm. I, I would differentiate that too. And, uh, and a friend of mine, Max Vellmans, um, who wrote a seminal book on, 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 on you know, the consciousness, also differentiates it in this way. So I'm, I'm very happy to differentiate it in this way too. When we say that the universe is conscious, what exactly do you mean by that? I mean that the universe, by existing and evolving as a non-locally unified entity, which is innately and meaningfully informed and holographically manifest, means that it is aware of itself in its totality, which is why the informational flows, processes that we see from and patternings and relationships from the very, very most fundamental scales to the whole of the universe can play out. It, it's, it's the universe in that sense, from the, all the evidence we have, it's rather like it can't be a little bit pregnant. <laughs> it's like it, 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 it's in its entirety and therefore in its holographic manifestation at every level, every, ev the wholeness is expressed in every pixel, every cell, if you like. Just as our 37 trillion cells make up our collective consciousness and we can consider ourselves as a cell, you know, cells of our planetary consciousness. Mm -hmm. So our planetary consciousness, we can consider cells of our universal consciousness, it seems to me. 
there are people who are very afraid of, of that idea that we might become the, you know, like cogs in a giant machine. And I think what you're saying, it's not a machine. Absolutely, it's not a machine. It's a living, breathing, evolving entity of which we are in a part. And it's absolute opposite of cogs in a machine because we've had a materialistic and separation-based paradigm that has taken out any meaning for our universe, excluded any purposefulness in our universe, seen evolution as a whole process of random events, and consciousness is somehow arising at the end of a very long process, this turns that completely on its head. This re-enchants the universe. This re-imbues our universe with inherent meaning and evolutionary purpose. It re-imbues that evolutionary impulse of which we are, are a part. Our planetary home, Gaia, is a part. This is empowering. This is the opposite of cogs in a machine. This is empowering agents, evolutionary agents, conscious agents of our entire universe and, and planetary home. Many years ago, I interviewed a great philosopher and religious scholar, Houston Smith, about the question of meaning. And uh, he suggested, I loved his definition, he said, the, the closer we are to God, the more meaningful everything becomes. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And you know, you can argue, you know, I, I describe the infinite and eternal cosmic plenum, the, the ground of being from which universes arise as great thoughts, you know, as being great thoughts in the mind of God. You know, God for me is everything. But equally, I'm happy with the term great spirit, great mystery, cosmic mind, Allah, whatever term we bring to this realization that we are these microcosmic co-creators of, a, of an infinite eternal cosmos that has this audacity to create universes as great thoughts. Mm -hmm. What a wondrous, what a wondrous realization and awakening that potentially can be for us as a, as a human species. I know we're getting near to the end of this particular conversation, and we've barely covered uh, all of biological evolution. But I, I want to go back, if, uh, if you don't mind, to your personal story, because uh, I, through most of this conversation, you've come across as a very knowledgeable scientist with uh, in, an encyclopedic mind and, and vast amounts of data that you can share with us. But I know you your journey began really with, uh, I, I guess, what I would call a mystical experience or a series of them. A, a, life, a lifetime of them, actually. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it did. And, and because of that, when I was four years old and we've had conversations about this, I did have my first aware mystical experience. And so I, I from then, I experienced reality in a much more expansive way as a meaningful, as a purposeful, as a joyous, as a multidimensional real realities. And so I've been walking between worlds all my life in training to be a scientist, in, in, in undergoing that, that sort of teaching for a scientific method. It really brought my experiential awareness of this great sense of reality, into a question of how does such an amazing um, mind, consciousness, we call the cosmos, how does that come into our world? How does that appear as our world? So I spent from very young age through Oxford University with a master's degree in cosmology and physics and researching ancient cosmologies so as a PhD and many, many, many other ways of seeking to share this convergence because I've never seen science and spirituality being at odds with each other. They're, in a way, they're compl they can be complementary ways of, of discovery and knowing. And now with what we've been sharing and what I, I share in my books, we really have the evidence now, the scientific evidence 
that is converging with, you know, universal wisdom teachings, traditions of indigenous wisdom and spiritual experiences. So I talk about the three words, the three paths of the sage, the mind, the shaman, the heart, and the seer, the mystic as now converging into a, a profound awakening opportunity and potential that serve can serve our conscious evolution. So my own journey has been absolutely part of the path for me. Well, you certainly embody the philosophy that you express, which, which is a joy for me to be in conversation with you. But at the same time, it seems to me there are other forces on, on this planet, forces that would like to treat the human being not, not as a uh, self-aware, autonomous individual, but more like a worker bee, uh, more like a machine, some, someone who's going to fit in and, and keep society running and keep the economy growing. Yes, and I think that plays back to sort of almost like the late 19th century, your industrial mechanistic, you know, approach. What's happening now, though, is that approach has got us to a point, it seems to me, that is utterly unsustainable with our whole our well-being, our ability to even survive, as well as our relationship with Gaia and all the damage we've imposed upon our planetary home because of that, you know, mis misperception of materiality and separation. What I'm really excited about, and it is happening now because we do have the evidence now, which I do feel is a change maker. Before it, we've known in our hearts, we've hoped, we've had faith, you know, that this, you know, this unity and diversity could really be possible. But we now have the evidence to say that unity isn't an ideal. It is real. It's not an aspiration. It's our existential reality. As my two dear friends, Julie Krull and Joni Carley, also speak to, and many other voices now are coming forward, and many, many ever more compelling evidence is revealing this fundamental unity and enabling us to... To, to come together in a unitive narrative that can underpin and frame all that we are and can do together. It literally changes everything. You do see in the biological world uh, uh, sometimes a hierarchy, not, not exactly a, a unity. For example, in an ant colony, a termite colony, or even a bee colony, you've got your worker bees and you've got the queen bee. And uh, I think there, there, there's a sense in, amongst some elements of our society that we should structure ourselves that way with a, a caste system, so to speak. It's interesting, you know, because in new social communities like bees and wasps and, and termites and, and ants, personally, I would not want to be a queen bee because... <laughs> You're forever, you know, everybody looks after you, but my goodness me, you're, 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 you're laying eggs 24-7. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's not so much a hierarchy. It's more a, it's more a, a sort of a, a complete um, collective where each role has its part. And in those you social communities, and there are only a few of them, blind mole rats are the only other ones we know of. There's only five types of you social communities like that. They're almost themselves at an evolutionary dead end because there's no flexibility to change. That's, that's their joy. That's their, their great effectiveness. But that is their evolutionary end point. And so for evolution to continue, there has to be that ability to change. And, you know, the biosphere and the Gaia sphere of Gaia are less hierarchies. They're not, they're rarely hierarchies. And even new social communities are less hierarchies. Than collectives, it's more of a holarchy. It's more of nested relationships where everything's in relationship with everything else, and we can't separate a biological organism from its surroundings. It's an entire biospheric ecosystem, and we can't separate the biosphere from Gaia's rocks and minerals, her geosphere, her waters, her hydrosphere, her atmosphere. It's a total Gaia sphere that exists and evolves 
as a completely independent, coherent whole. Well, I'm under the impression that if, if we don't remember that lesson, we will become an evolutionary dead end. I, I feel we will, because Gaia's own innate evolutionary impulse, you know, will not tolerate this, this, this situation, I don't feel. She, and, and in the past, that's happened too. You know, there's been a sort of an end point to an evolutionary arc, and then there's been some form of breakdown. Some lesser, some more, but nonetheless a breakdown. And in that breakdown, there is a breakthrough. So the question is, what are we going to do? Are we, as you say, Jeff, are we going to wake up and in doing so consciously evolve or are we not? I hope we do. I hope we do because what an adventure. What an adventure. You point out that 99% of all the species that ever existed on this planet have already gone extinct. And I suspect it's a lot more than that. It's at least that. I think it's probably 99.999 more. Yeah, and we are the last of our hominin kind. You know, when our hominin ancestry split off from the great apes about six and a half million years ago, there have been probably more than 20 different types of hominins, including Neanderthals, but also including, you know, um, Hadwagaris, um, oh, Afri oh, so many. Denisovians. Denisovians and, and, and so many. The point is we're the last of our kind in that regard. And yet we're not alone. As I say, right at the end of the book, we are the last of our kind, but we are not alone because we are Gaians. And if perhaps waking up to realize that we are Gaians, we can hopefully heal our relationship with her and wake up and grow up to become her co-evolutionary partner in moving forward. That is my hope, and that is what I truly believe we are able to do. Well, Jude Curavan, once more, it's an incredible joy to be in conversation with you and to share you with the New Thinking Aloud audience. From the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for being with me today. Jeff, thank you. As always, it's such a delight and such a privilege to be with you. Thank you. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us. Thank you.